Erling is going to uh, talk about. He has an extensive talk, and uh, somewhat I'm uh, happy that we have more time because Dr. Shaw is not here. Erling can use that time and go through his presentation. He uh, was kind enough to tell me that he wants to this uh, presentation to be relaxed. He wants to give you the courtesy of interrupting him, asking questions. So please uh, feel free to do that, and I'm sure he's going to tell you. Okay. Early. Yeah, it's my privilege to try to present uh, a consensus document where there has not always been so much consensus, but a lot of discussion and divergent opinion. But as Mo told you, now I'll try to, to give you this presentation of where we stand now. We have not finished. We have not reached the end of, of, of our mission. But this is where we stand now. And please feel free to interrupt if you have some questions or comments. Um, I'm going to try to present this new paradigm in risk assessment in coronary artery disease. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. My strains is probably the last. It's my limitations. So I am allowed to ask stupid questions because, in fact, I don't know so much about imaging, statistics, prediction tools, or cost-effectiveness analysis. So I have asked a lot of questions. I don't understand all the answers I have received, but now I will just try to present what I think is the consensus of this task force group. It started uh, more than a year ago with this paper in circulation, October 2003, a call for new definition and risk assessment strategies. And it is said that available screening and diagnostic methods are insufficient to identify the victims before the event occur, and it is the fact. Many of you know this paper from JAMA 2003, where it was shown that the major risk factor for ischemic heart disease account for the disease. Nearly all persons that have a heart attack have at least one major risk factor for coronary artery disease. So these factors are causal. They cause the disease. Nevertheless, the problem is also people that don't have the disease have these risk factors. So, and it was also said in a letter in JAMA after this uh, paper was printed, that the predictive value of these risk factors are low. You cannot find out, you cannot predict who are going to have a heart attack or who, and who will not have a heart attack. It's also an analogy that has been mentioned several times. It was uh, mentioned also in British Medical Journal by Wall some years ago. No one will question that smoking is a major risk factor for lung cancer. Nevertheless, if everyone in a certain population smoked 20 cigarettes a day, asking about cigarette consumption would not distinguish those who are more likely to de develop lung cancer from those who are not. And it's the same with risk factors for cardiovascular disease. They are so prevalent that you cannot use them for prediction. And it was in fact that, uh, that, that fact that was behind the polypill strategy introduced a few years ago. If you can't find the people who need treatment, then why not treat all? And they suggested that all about age 55 should be treated with this polypill to reduce risk factors for the disease. And it is, uh, it is a reason we cannot predict and we cannot use risk factors. It's because there is so huge an overlap between those who develop disease and those who do not develop disease. This curve here is the distribution of cholesterol for those who develop the disease, and this one is the distribution for those who do not develop the disease. And down here is for, for blood pressure. It's the same. There is a huge overlap. So in this intermediate range, and what Fuster also told us before, there is a large group here in the middle, 
where you cannot predict. Only if blood pressure or cholesterol is very low, it says something, or very high, it says something. But most of us are in the intermediate range, and that range you cannot use risk factor for prediction. There's also, in the recent years and few months, been a lot of discussion about relative risk. It's used frequently in epidemiological study to, to show the strains of an association. It can be set by relative risk. And in fact, many of these markers that is used to pre predict ischemic heart disease present their data as relative risk. But in this paper published by People last year, it was in fact said that a marker with an odds ratio as high as three is in fact a very poor classification tool. So even if there is a strong association indicated by the relative risk, it does not necessarily indicate that this marker can be used for risk stratification, finding the people that need treatment, separating them from those who do not need treatment. Again, it's shown here, large distribution overlap by a marker, those who develop the disease here, the solid line, those who do not develop the disease, broken line, there is an odds ratio of three, there's huge overlap, you cannot use this marker for prediction. So what we know today, and I think we can agree on that, in principle, most heart attack is preventable. We know what causes heart attack. We have causal risk factors. However, heart attack remains the number one killer in Western society, including the United States. So I think it's fair to say that this traditional approach has failed. It's still and remain the major killer. So I think we can, we can, we can ask, do we need another approach? Can we do it differently? And can we do it better than just counting risk factor, going into table, finding a score, and we cannot use a score because we cannot predict in many of these patients. So, again, going back in history, going from the vulnerable plaque, it started by vulnerable plaque, to now where we are today, the vulnerable patients. The vulnerable plaque was described in part one of these three papers. Number three will come. In part two, the vulnerable plaque and vulnerable myocardium was described in the same month in circulation a week later. And there's been a lot of discussion. I don't believe so much in vulnerable myocardium in primary prevention. I think the vulnerable myocardium frequently in ischemic heart disease come after you have myocardial damage. And I think more probably agree on that, at least I received this email from you just a few days ago where you agreed that probably vulnerable myocardium and also vulnerable black blood vulnerable <coughs> play a more important role after a heart attack or during a heart attack rather than in primary prevention. But there may be two situations where vulnerable blood and vulnerable myocardium could play a role in primary prevention. In diabetes and the metabolic syndrome, we know there's an increased platelet activation. There is high fibrinol level and high plasminogen activator inhibitor. And it could contribute to thrombus formation if a plaque rupture. So in diabetes, the vulnerable blood could, could play an additional role on top of the disease. And in hypertension, maybe the, the a hypertrophic myocardium could play a role in sudden death and could explain some cases of sudden death in primary prevention uh, left, in left ventricular hypertrophy. So diabetes and left ventricular hypertrophy could be states where vulnerable blood and vulnerable myocardium play a role in primary prevention. In this report, we are going to, we are, have written now, 
Huang Badimon has written a paper on the vulnerable blood and some polymorphism in markers of the thrombotic component of the blood, but there is no really good marker that can be used in primary prevention for prediction. And we have also a paper here by Dr. Rudy that has written about non-invasive assessment of vulnerable myocardium, but again, it is probably not today very effective to identify vulnerable myocardium in primary prevention. So now we have reached the vulnerable patient. And the vulnerable patient is defined here as a patient at high risk, how high, of a near-term event, what is meant by near-term. It's a way we define a vulnerable patient. Again, we know that these risk factors are causal. Again, this paper published in Lancet last year, the Interheart study, studying a case control study from every inhabited countries in the continent on this globe, showing again that the major risk factors account for the great majority of heart attack, 90% in men and 94% in women. But why are they useless for prediction? Probably because the individual susceptibility to these risk factors vary. And there is also some protective factor we don't know so much about. Just to illustrate the difference between risk factors for the disease and susceptibility to the disease. Many of you have seen this before. I have it from John Romberger, Sir Winston Churchill. He died 91 years old, not of a heart attack, while Jim Fix died of a heart attack 53 years old. I could imagine there was no major difference in risk factors, or they don't necessarily need to be any major difference in risk factor. It could just be because Jim Fix was more susceptible for this disease, while Churchill has, Churchill has strong arteries. He was not susceptible to these risk factors. And it was we, 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 we miss in our risk assessment today, it is the susceptibility to the disease. We are only measuring risk factors for the disease. So a group met half a year ago in Santa Monica, some of them are here, and we discussed how to proceed with the identification of the vulnerable patients. And again, a lot of discussion, a lot of emails, here one from Mort in February this year. I think the discussion was out of, you, you, you needed to direct the discussion again, I think. So we said, let's not forget the most important question, the short-term prediction, you call short-term, less than five years, in search of the vulnerable patients. You don't define in this email the vulnerable patient. But I, have, I know what you mean with a vulnerable patient. So again, the approach today, it is in risk assessment. It is based on risk factors. It's office-based. And you calculate whether the person is in low or lower risk of having a heart attack, not in near term, but during the next 10 years, intermediate risk or high risk, also called coronary heart disease or coronary heart disease risk equivalent. In fact, there is only a factor two difference between people that already have the disease or are at in the same level of risk as though we today call low risk a factor two in scoring. And we learned before by paper study that even a, a, a relative risk of three will not be able to separate those who are going to have the disease from those who will not have the disease. 
So our risk assessment tool we are using, in principle, they are not able to risk stratify the population. So we suggest that we do it differently. We are not measuring primarily risk factors for the disease. We are trying to assess the susceptibility for the disease. In our search for the vulnerable patients, it's only very few out here, but it's, it's what's keeping us going. It is the search for the few out there who need immediately an intense treatment. But in our search for the vulnerable patients, in fact, we have a lot of information about the patients or about the individual. So we are able to risk stratify the whole population in those who have the disease more or less of the disease, they are more or less susceptible for the disease. We'll find those who don't have the disease and are not at risk of having a heart attack. And we will start by defining a very low risk group. We don't need to screen in our search for the vulnerable patients. And here we have the conceptual flow chart that come out from all these talks and all this discussion. Our search for the vulnerable patients. What is a vulnerable patient? Risk of a heart attack in the near future, within the next five years. And Maud would say we would like a high risk patients with a risk for a heart attack in the next year for about 10%. It's a very high risk. It's in fact the same risk that we see in patients the first year after an acute coronary syndrome. This one is the risk of a recurrent event. And now we would like to find people in primary prevention without any symptoms with the same level of risk. I don't know if we are able to do it, but it is our goal. And uh, we could discuss later which kind of tool, and probably Maud will tell us what we can do to find these, these person in primary prevention with that high level of risk of having a heart attack, 10% within the next year. I don't think we have the tool, but I, I agree with you, it is our goal. The best marker for susceptibility for the disease, it is to having the disease. And the more disease you have, the higher risk. And it is, in fact, already in the established guideline for the NCEP guidelines say if you have peripheral artery disease, if you have the disease in the femoral artery, if you have the disease in the carotid artery, if you have an aneurysm in the abdominal aorta, you have a coronary heart disease risk equivalent. You have the same risk as if you have the disease in your coronary artery. So it's, an, it's, it's a concept that is well established that the best marker for susceptibility is prevalent disease. But what we use today, it is not prevalent arterial disease, it is prevalent clinical disease. But now we have the tool to be able, some of us believe we have the tool, to be able to identify the disease itself before giving rise to clinical syndrome. So we now can extend this same concept by susceptibility, by going to the disease itself in the vessel wall, evaluate the disease, how much disease is there, and base our risk assessment on the amount of the disease. It is just an extension of what we already are doing now because we have the ability to identify the disease. We have many different tools we can use today ultrasound, MR, CT, uh, compliance measurements, endothelial dysfunction measurements. Uh, some of them has been, have been used longer than others. Some of them have been used for many years and there is some clinical outcome data. So we can say something more of some of these tools, there's ability to predict a clinical outcome. We can come back to these tools later.
So, now I would like to go through this flow chart in a stepwise fashion. And you, if you have any questions or comments, please say something. First, yes, Jay. Uh, Erling, I, I, it's a beautiful summary of this whole issue. I think the the uh, the issue that is still somewhat unclear, though, is at what stage one should intervene. May I come back? Well, yeah. Can you come with because I, I I will discuss it in a few slides. Well, I guess so, but you've already kind of addressed. The Five okay. and, and ten year issue and I, I guess I would just like to, to put this on the table because if you're if you're looking at the uh, the poly pillar course yeah. that was aimed not to reduce five year or ten year risk it, the aim was basically to pre reduce the incidence of events during a person's productive years so if one is 30, we're interested in the 30-year risk, not the five-year risk. It's a very different issue, and it may be that is what the five-year risk, uh, trying to identify the vulnerable patient within five years of an event, is one way to th look at it. But in fact, if one is going to really have an impact on disease occurrence and health care costs in a whole society, which is what the polypill story was aimed at, one really has to look at lifetime risk, not five-year risk. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another way, that, that's more the issue of going down to the bottom of the pyramid and looking at the whole population, not for five-year risk, but for individuals who at whatever age they're at yeah. are on a trajectory for an event yes. before some arbitrary age that we feel is premature. And uh, it's a very different kind of uh, approach. And I just wonder whether everybody is clear on that, because I think it really makes a striking difference in how you approach the I problem. Have some comments later about okay. That. Is it okay? Do we have some comments? Yeah, I think that Jay has a great point, because that would also capture primary care physicians who treat their patients not for five or ten years, but for ten and twenty and thirty years. And I think by, I think it would, it would, it would motivate them to look at this in a different way. Um, with the whole idea of the, fi of the studies that we always talk about um, lose some of their meaning, even the idea of how diabetes develops, say, in all hat, or some of the other hypertension studies, because it did not, was not there long enough to afflict the patients. The primary care physicians are confused about this. And then Verdecchia publishes a paper that looks at people for 15 years and was published a year ago, and looks at the impact of new onset diabetes as being almost equivalent to long-standing diabetes. And, and I think the, what was mentioned before, I'll just, the idea of the metabolic syndrome and diabetes making cancer look like a picnic is, is something that has to be encouraged, because as has been said, cancer comes and it messes with you badly, and if you're lucky enough to survive, you'll have scars, but you'll, you may live after a year. Reality is though that cancer and or diabetes, you know, metabolic, I'm sorry, diabetes or metabolic syndrome is just getting warmed up after a couple of years. And by the time the disease gets rolling, you no longer have the option of putting the brakes on. And at that point, all you can do is try to slow it, but you certainly can't do anything else. And the autopsy studies, some of the data that came out of Cleveland on these, the, the looking at coronaries via IVIS, in people that had died, and 85% of people over the age of 50 had significant plaque in their coronaries. That's a message that primary prevention in this country is abysmal. Right, exactly right. And these are people that had no antecedent history. And those kind of studies are the ones that are motivating, along with the homunculus that you guys used in one of your earlier studies about the vulnerable patient not being the Scandinavian girl of age 20 with a cholesterol of 250. I think this is where the motivation has to be. And looking for long-term risk may motivate the people that treat people who develop long-term risk, who are the biggest number of physicians in the country, which is primary care. Uh, while I'm just taking this to Erling, I want to quickly comment. We are not creating a whole new textbook of preventive cardiology. We are trying to add a small chapter, which we believe 
can fill in the gap that largely exists. And we think that can, has, that can bring a very high added value. Uh, Jay is a pioneer in preventive cardiology. For years, he spent his life to educate people, start early. Jay's and many other pioneers, Slambler, Bill Kennell, and others, taught us risk factors and brought American Heart Association to where it is. But believe it or not, in the past 30 years, we have doubled diabetes, as he supposed to greatly show you. We have created metabolic syndrome. When I was in med school, we didn't have it. We have now, and we're creating a lot more. This is going out. This is a dead horse. You beat it, and you beat it. This is dead. We have to come with something that would be added to it. I, nobody here in our team would ever want it to stand against the current push from governmental st you know, level to early days in high school prevention, primary care physician. We all in agree are in agreement with that. The well, problem is we can't just sit and see the same thing happen for three, four decades and just think that we have a good idea. Well, that was a good idea, but we need now more ideas. And that's what the whole shape is about. And one more thing about short term is, many of us, when we discuss in Santa Monica, is when you, when you have a patient walk in and you're telling him about his 20 years risk, he has so many other problems from his rent next month to his so many other family. You can't get into his priority when you're talking about 20 years. If you tell him you are a walking time bomb as he had, and he has a coronary calcium of 500, and you can tell him, show him the real data that out of those who had coronary calcium 500, comparing who had zero, there were 30 times higher risk at higher risk or they died. This would move people. Now, that was one example. We all know that we need to go further to come with a better test, easier test, less uh, biohazard, and all the things that Erling is going to bring up in, in, towards the end of discussion. Well, he, Jay, has a, Jay, has, Jay has a way to, to exp, explain it very nicely. In endothelial function a slide that he has, it shows a lifetime progress. We have to be able to identify, to actually detect that early stage and tag them. Put them a tag, you are in this trajectory in 30 years, you're going to be this if you don't do anything about it. Yeah, I, I, one thing I have to, I have to agree with you that you can't if you've never lied before. If you lied before and you tell him you smoke and you will have a heart attack and he smokes for 90 years, which is like this guy, and he never has a heart attack, you have a problem. We as medical community have a problem talking with people when they have high cholesterol. And this guy walked into my, my uh, study and he said, my grandfather, has cholesterol for the, we know that. We're talking about identifying disease. Yeah. I think everybody in this room is prepared to say risk factors are over with Perfect. as the screening factor. We, so don't have to, we don't have to battle that yeah. because I think that's what the Given. people here feel. Exactly. Outside, I can yeah. assure you, in the epidemiological community, they are not prepared to give up risk factors at the primary. Then, I, then I'll just take off my head and say, totally agree with you, we have to find the disease at that stage. We have to have the test that is validated widely and reproducibly available to all people at low cost and say, now you have this tool that you catches. Have the disease, you've got, you've got to, exactly. That's exactly, no, I agree totally with you.
I, I don't think I need this one, do I? No, no, I don't want yeah. to. Okay. Actually, it, it was a good discussion. It's a different approach. It, it was not the goal or, or the background behind uh, the vulnerable plaque concept. And it's the reason we, uh, we, 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 we look at it from different perspectives. It, it's the vulnerable patient. You know that. Well, we have to define the vulnerable patient. Yes. It's yes. 10% per year risk, then in plea, that is at the end yeah. of yeah, but, but it is nevertheless, you, you can argue about how to define the vulnerable patients, and, and we can come back to that, how to define the vulnerable patient. But it was the goal to identify, and we, 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 don't, we will not go to 20 years or 30 years old people to look for vulnerable patients defined in this way. We also agree on that. But then we, we could get, well, maybe we should expand the shape concept, and it was we are doing now in some way, but we should agree on it. And, and, and in fact, it, 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 Mott has been very strong about the vulnerable patients. He wants to go for the vulnerable patients. It has been the goal for so long time, and we don't look for vulnerable patients at 30 years old people. So it's a reason. Uh, but maybe we can discuss it later. But where should we look for the vulnerable patients? What, what, how should we define the population at risk where we have vulnerable individuals? And we say, well, we will start screening all men about 45 and all female about 55. It's, uh, and why did we say that? We did say that because the first, a first heart attack, according to American Heart Statistics, is very rare in men below 45 and in female below 55. It is, it is rare. And Death due to ischemic heart disease, 96 percent of all deaths from coronary heart disease or stroke occur in people aged 55 and over. It was the people behind the polypill concept. It was the reason they chose age 55, where everybody should take a polypill. So I would be provocative and say, if you have an effective treatment and you can identify those who need the treatment, then we can wait screening until 55 years, and you will be able to prevent nearly all deaths from this disease. In principle, it's provocative. And if you have such a kind of treatment, if you have such a kind of treatment, why should we start down here if you can prevent it up here? We cannot. So, in fact, we need in some way to find a good compromise and, and combine the approach by going hard in here to find the vulnerable patients up here, but start low here by some general uh, uh, recommendations at the society level and so on to prevent people to reach this level where they need an, a, a, an intensive treatment. I, yes? I think Dr. Fuster made that point very yeah. clear in a sense that I know from my discussion with him exactly agreeing to what you just said. In terms of the age, obviously, he, is, he feels very strong that you have to look at the disease or try to prevent the disease early on. But the aspect of this, the most impact you're going to have if you have something related to society changes, government getting involved there and trying to set the state. You're not going to screen these patients, these, these, these kids. But you need an effect that is at the level of the government, of the society, that's going to change, basically, that would be probably a much more effective way and captured much more effectively than just screening them and not finding anything. Mm -hmm. Or finding something, but you know. So, so I, I actually you know, agree with, with, with you know, what you just said here right there. This is what John Deanfield has done. He's gone around England with a, 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 with a truck looking at regular activity with kids. And, and he actually has a computer program that has looked at the impact of intervention and has identified Can you hear it down what is being said or should we use a microphone? Okay. 
Uh, ja? Oké. Okay. Uh, then we have defined the population at risk. And then we need, is there some people we right away, right away up front can exclude? We don't need to screen these people. And just going to existing guidelines in the NCEP guidelines here, it is set they have a lower risk group here. Almost all people with zero or one risk factors have a 10 years risk, less than 10%. And 10 years risk assessment in people with zero or one risk factor is thus not necessary. So they have in this algorithm or this guideline, they have a group, they also say we don't need an extensive risk assessment. If there only is one risk factor, they go to the lower risk group without a Framingham scoring. There's other people that has identified a low risk group This paper in JAMA by Stamler some years ago, they identify also a low risk group. Uh, and in this low risk group, there's no risk factors at all. And there is no prehypertension, so they have even a lower blood pressure than is the level 140, about 90, that counts as a risk factor. And in this group, unfortunately, oh, less than 10% of the US population belong to this group, but it was in fact a very low risk group. So with this risk profile, it has a very high negative predictive value. So if you have this risk factor, your risk of having a heart attack is extremely low. So it is an even lower low risk group than that identified by the National Cholesterol Education Program. And it is in fact this low risk group that is uh, endorsed by the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology at a blood pressure that is even below the prehypertensive level. It is a low risk group and it, they originate also from the Framingham. It is the top on each of these, it's the, 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 the low risk group that all other groups are compared with when the relative risk is calculated. And we have suggested in the SHAPE guideline you should use this very low risk group up front to exclude people that don't need to be screened. What do you say? No, we will put the family history also in, in there. Of course we will that. But nevertheless, the data are here. Even though they did not have family history, without having family history, it was a very low risk group. We are afraid by putting too many criteria in here. You don't You have a blood, uh, a cholesterol that needs to be below that, a pressure below that, no smoking, no diabetes, no family history, no metabolic syndrome and so on. You end up with no people in that group. And then you can screen all of them. So defined in that way, you have a low risk group. But I think we'll put family history in there because easy. We already have that. It is a suggestion. Yeah. Okay, now we have the population at risk. We have excluded a very low risk group. We don't need to screen. Then we can go to the screening test for atherosclerosis. And again, we have a lot of possibilities here and we can discuss them later, I think. And, and it's the slides where I think we should have discussed the discussion we already have had. It's the trajectory for this disease. Can you early in life, by doing some kind of assessment, can you then predict with that amount or degree of decibel disease you are on a trajectory and you will pass the clinical horizon here prematurely or you will pass it and get a heart attack. Of course, you, if you can identify it down here, already down here, then it makes sense to intervene down here because probably the intensity of intervention will be less down here if you wait until intervening up here. But the reason we have not been in so much discussion about that, it is because the focus has been on the vulnerable patient and, and it's not the focus on, it's not the vulnerable patient. 
nearly everything. Uh, uh, I, I would assume there is also different goal in, in current gui guidelines according to risk assessment. The LDL goal could be lower. You need to. I, th I think because if you only down here, if you only slower the progression of the disease a little bit, you will not end up by having clinical disease. Up here, up here, you need to stop the progression. You don't need down here to stop the progression. You need to slow the progression. You need to stop it up here. You need to stop it up here. Okay, so everybody should have a statin down here. Of course. Okay. Yep. But, but Jay, if you don't need if you don't need a statin down here and you can wait up here, why do uh, is it reasonable to start treatment so early if you don't need to treat so early? What's the downside? Well, there is oh, a lot of downside. Oh, downside. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't there any downside? If you find somebody paying for it, if you find somebody who is compliant. No, you should, should not pe put young people on medication if it's not necessary. <laughs> no. Because what his ideology is, and it's what his ideology is, and it's very well conveyed in his talk, in Jay's talk, is if you're able to accurately identify those people who are on different days, <coughs> Some people will not have the disease, some people will have the disease more or less. Those who don't have the disease, 
church of elite children. Which they have very high cholesterol levels, elite children. So we need to measure with factors. So we don't need a comprehensive risk assessment. We don't need a computer. We don't need a calculator. We don't need a chart or a table. So here, we can just measure risk factor and treat the risk factor that play a causal role in the development of the disease. Over here again, there has been some discussion about this term vulnerability. Could it be used relatively? Or is it an absolute term? We have a vulnerable patient, that's it. Or could people be more or less vulnerable? Could the vulnerability increase when they go from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid? So to, just to avoid confusion, I have called this increasing vulnerability up here for such a severe that it's just another word. And it should be small because we would like to reserve the term vulnerable for the vulnerable patient. You could do that. So it could reduce the vulnerability. Isn't it the same? To me it is, but I'm not so good in your language. So we could use them relatively or in absolute term. When the vulnerability have reached a certain level, then you have a vulnerable patient. And I would prefer, and I've discussed it also with Mort, not to use the term vulnerable patient for a whole population in primary prevention. They are not patients. But instead call them vulnerable individual. Uh, not make them to patients. You could make them to patients when they reach here. But up here you could say they are vulnerable person or vulnerable individual. And when they have reached a level where they need intensive treatment, then of course they become patients. See, one, one problem early is you're making the assumption that people progress from moderately high risk to high risk to very high risk. A lot of people die in various stages of that before they've reached the so-called high-risk category. Yet die of what? Coronary Of a heart disease. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how many from th this group will in short term be vulnerable patients. How many from this group in short term will go up? But some will. Yes? I don't know if we have any data that will tell how many of the vulnerable patients. It's the reason, in fact, I have put this arrow out. It does not go through this one. Can you see it? The other issue, because, course, but, but I think it is out there. The other issue we have to cope with, if you're dealing with a 10-year risk, then it is, it, it is a prerequisite then to have regular checkups of people to determine when they reach the high-risk category. And if you only have one crack at them, <laughs> you're never going to be able to identify the, the next phase. Well, that's why we have five-year risk. Yep. Every five years, we have to reassess. They have reassessed every five years. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it is tough. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's in the, it's, it's in the algorithm. It's reassessment every five years. Yeah, it's yeah. even more yeah. modern. even more than, yeah. than a one-time. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. the five years is even more, more moderate, modest than, than cancer uh, screening. One other thing is, Erling has uh, alluded, but didn't finish it. We really decided to not tag vulnerable patient at this stage because we are in short of data to a certain risk level percentage because we don't have the tool to act. So it is a still as a conceptual, as I said to Dr. Fuster. The more you go toward the top of the pyramid, the more you are vulnerable. Dr. Brownwald tend to agree to put very high risk group, which is this group, as vulnerable. And he said, you can call it vulnerable, we let's call it very high risk. But because this is a new category, we didn't have it before in our, in our de definitions. But let's just keep this conceptual until we come to a very peaceful mind. We have already created a lot of uh, fronts for, for fights. We don't need to fight over this one. Whereas this is a conceptual, and we agree, but these are exact categories. Now, the answer to the question, how many people from this one will have a heart attack in the next year or five years? How many people from this one, how many? We don't know exactly, but we know here is a lot more than here in ratio or proportion, and it's a lot more than here. That's why we call it moderately high risk, high risk, and very high risk. Once we come to end of a 10 year study, perhaps after MESA come out, and we have really time to digest and chew every part of MESA, we might be able to put numbers here, which would be great. And that's what we're doing. Well, we information on that, that 
not only the magnitude of the scores associated with risk, your one plus two plus three plus, but we also have some data that shows that rate of progression. Um, so when tests are done serially, that the more rapidly, I think that's Paolo's data, that shows the more rapidly the disease progresses, the greater the risk. So I think we do already have some. Yeah, but you agree we need to have more data. Uh, yeah. We need to have more data from that and from IMT and other markers of disease, so it will be comprehensive. Because we're only doing the, 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 the analysis of people who survive to get the repeated measurements. Yeah, but I think in that data, those people are followed. And we do have some outcome data for the people who are in each category. Do, do we know the converse? I'm sorry to, to sort of raise No, this is not sorry. This is what we are here. Do we know the converse of, of a thousand patients who have an MI? What category are they in? Mm -hmm. I want to ask everybody an answer. Uh, Harvey had some data uh, presented in our meeting. Retrospectively, we all reviewed that paper in Jack, who uh, Mark, uh, John Rumer here nicely put in the slide that these 250 people who died with heart attack, age uh, 50 to 60, that very young group, and diabetes, the day before their heart attack, if you, screen, if you put them according to NCEP, you will find 65, 70%, 75%, 72% categorized at medium risk, 83% categorized medium and low risk, which was shocking. Based, so on, risk, based on risk factor. Based yeah. on risk yeah. factor. Well, what about based on disease? Positivity yeah. of disease. Nobody we we asked, don't know. This was the question. It's new. That, yeah, this was the question <laughs> that but, but so. Matt asked. Matt, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say it's about 20% of patients were high risk, about 80% were not high risk. Some were low risk. Low risk or medium. Medium. About 80% were defined medium and low risk, not a big but red line, and I'm going to die tomorrow or have a heart attack tomorrow. This is what the major problem. Now, was that based on framing gram? Yes, framing gram. Now, so the point but here is the very important question, and that's the question actually. PK put in his contribution that the first thing we need to call for is do we have a very clear distinction between the disease uh, versus risk factor for the, 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 uh, in the near future? Well, we all know, and there are some studies done in people who came with chest pain and did coronary calcium scoring, significant predicted value and sharp contrast. We know that, but we have to call for further research. And I think, Erling, we, this is one of the things that we need to take home here in a, perhaps a one page or two page, specifically call for certain really, I mean, this is not a proposal for a study, but it's a question that triggers a very, you know, clear path to design a study for, mm -hmm. to answer that question. And that question is very critical. But then, of course, we need the, uh, we, we want to, to risk or stratify the amount of disease in some way. Here we have one plus, two, three plus. It's what we can do. Because it, it, it depends on the tool we are using. And here we need to find some threshold levels between one and two plus. And so it's arbitrary. It's a continuum in many situations. So it must depend on the tool we are using, how to stratify the amount of the disease and the amount of atherosclerosis. Then it came, I think it's some paradoxical that in this uh, risk stratification we also will use myocardial ischemia to find the vulnerable patient down here. Because when this organization started many years ago, it was started because of some kind of opposition to the cardiologists that were so focused on the stenotic lesions. And we knew that most myocardial infarction did not originate from stenotic lesions. And now we'll use a test for a coronary stenosis to find a patient at risk of a heart attack. To me, in the beginning, it makes no sense to me. But I know there is some data that tell you that you can risk stratify, but in fact, it's, it's in contrast to this movement the way it started, where we would like to say, we are not going for the stenotic lesion. What we are going for is a vulnerable lesion. And we would like to risk stratify it according to vulnerable lesion and not stenotic lesion. So I would prefer to have the vulnerable lesion up there. Well, here it is. Can we go back to our slide? <laughs> we have to wait 
How how long? A, how long back? This, this we have a pioneer in this room. That's Jim Muller. We started this whole thing. <coughs> and I want to ask Jim directly for this. When we started this, we were so obsessed about one vulnerable practice killing everybody. And this is a big fat uh, take part uh, thing part right from. And we were so obsessed. I thought it was hot. He thought it was uh, near infrared spectroscopy. Actually, Cassell's on this. Dr. Cassell thought it was hot. I was following it. But we came to realize that there is more than one one with five. Not 200, but more than one one with five. And also, this one with five, for most cases, they rupture silently. They go through a process of healing, calcification, and then rupture. And repeated rupture is a phenomenon that is silent to us completely, so we don't understand. So bottom line, we came to realize that upstream, downstream, or neighbor vessels, we have other plaques that went through this natural history further. They have the stenotic or uh, uh, obstructive lesion. And I drew this question to all of you last year, you remember before ACC, that do we have a statistic or an indication to say what percentage of these plaques are associated with a stenotic plaque upstream or downstream, or vice versa? What percentage of these plaques have a vulnerable factor? We, we got some answers, but obviously there is no data to answer this. So I want to take this question directly to Jim Marlon, who brought this up, and tell us, what do you think, Jim? Well, I assume we're here so they don't look exactly like that. Uh, I, uh, do I have that? is that a number of people have moved from vulnerable plaque to vulnerable patient, which being a, um, uh, in that large asymptomatic group, I'm glad people are doing that, and I hope they could find out if I'm a vulnerable patient or not. But I think there still is some utility in a group of people working on vulnerable plaque while others work on vulnerable patient. It's really a two-front approach that's better. Because when you said of all those heart attacks, 600,000 of them occur in people with no prior disease, well, the other 600,000 occur in people with prior disease. Right, So, or in, who are in a cath lab. So I think there's room for a crowd of people to work on that half of it, where in the people that are in the cath lab. As you know, and I probably should disclose, um, I'm, I'm no, I just took a leave of absence from academic medicine, so I'm now industry building a catheter to find vulnerable plaque in the coronary. Now, having said that, I think that if people who want to work on that part of the problem in the cath lab based have some luck and can find those lipid rich plaques uh, invasively, then that might help the non-invasive detection methods move along faster, which could then be applied to the general population. Also so, to learn. Also to learn yeah, so so I you know the article which I'm one of the uh, 300 co-authors on that says from vulnerable plaque to vulnerable patient, I I think that's an unfortunate title, because I think it ought to be vulnerable plaque and vulnerable patient. Well, we can also interpret that as a bridge, that it's an spectrum. You have one on one hand, you go to the other one. We have to, if we want to be successful. I I read it differently. I read it as let's forget about vulnerable plaque. Let's no, find vulnerable patient. <laughs> Yeah, but you see, I also think that a uh, you ask how would you find that 10% vulnerable patient? Well, if you could find a vulnerable plaque, that's a vulnerable patient, and it could. When you talk early about relative risk and cancer diagnosis, uh, if you find a melanoma diagnosis, you've got a relative risk of a thousand of having. If you find melanoma on a biopsy, you've got a relative risk of a thousand versus a person who doesn't have. If you could biopsy the tissue and find a vulnerable plaque, you'd probably have relative risk of 100 uh, for an
I just got a call that PK is coming in five minutes, so you can save some five minutes for him also. Uh, yeah. Is he coming now? Yeah. Okay, then, then I would like to cut here and make it simple. And I'm happy that Kupfer also said, make it simple, because I would like to skip this. But some people say, we are not finished today. We need to put something more. We don't, in fact, it indicates we don't believe in what we are doing, because if we are measuring the disease itself, why do we need all these additional markers if we are focusing on the disease in the best of all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what? But then we don't have a marker for that. No. no. Yes, we need. But then wait until we have it. Yes. But we should not put a call on the conceptual flow chart. I don't think we should put a call here.